Uh, yes, Novel. Everybody can see the history. Right. So this is the next case. While we're getting prepared, I'll just give you guys a briefing. It's a 68-year-old male patient who came in with hematemesis and epigastric pain. So we did an endoscopy. This patient was inpatient. He was managed uh, by medication and he stabilized. But the endoscopy had shown a submucosal bulge along the incisura. Um, on that basis, we did, a, and the overlying mucosa obviously was normal. So we went for a CT scan. It was a large heterogeneous enhancing exophytic mass in the gastric pylorus, measuring seven by three by 6.2 by 6.9. Um, so, uh, this basically seems like a submucosal bulge and uh, we'll basically be proceeding to examine it and it seems likely to be a gist. So over to Dr. Thomas. All right, thank you. You have the mic, right? I think I do. All right, Shukran, thank you. Um, All right, can everyone hear us, sir? Dr. Hassan? Are they able to hear it? Was Arya? Arya? Arya, okay. I see a thumbs up there somewhere. Take care. <coughs> okay, Dr. Hassan, are you able to hear us? Uh, we can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, like we just went over, this is a, a middle-aged man with uh, an intragastric lesion along the uh, lesser curvature. And uh, we're going to do EUS to quickly evaluate it. You know, a lot of what I do is very, very similar to what Dr. Hassan does. And so, I won't go through... Uh, the motions of, uh, of endoscopy, but the one thing that I do slightly differently is uh, the intubation part. So, uh, you know, just understanding the anatomy of the uh, hypopharynx is helpful in this case, and it's usually beneficial to put a slight uh, sort of tilt in the scope and bend it slightly uh, so that it's very easily being introduced uh, over the tongue to a point where. Uh, I'm hitting some type of a structure at the back and that's usually uh, the posterior pharyngeal wall. So once we hit that area, uh, so once we've touched the hypopharynx, it's usually a good habit to go up slightly on your wheel and what that does is it deflects the scope towards the posterior wall and then with a gradual sort of introductory motion, uh, we pass the scope down. Sir, zara utha lena. Thoda uppar utha lo. Okay, there we are. So, we're now in the esophagus. Okay. And I see some secretions here. So, we're going to ask to raise the head of the bed up a little bit and maybe sedate our patient a little deeper so that he does not uh, aspirate. Okay, thoda sa, and sir, utha there. Take the bed up a little bit. Okay, so the one thing that you never want to deal with is an aspiration during an endoscopy. And uh, I'm now focusing solely on two things. I'm looking at the color of the mucosa here in the esophagus. And I'm focusing on how much resistance there is to passage of my scope on the right. Like Dr. Hassan mentioned, you always want to be in a neutral position with your dials facing up and there being an unrestricted curvature on the body of your scope. So we're slowly introducing our scope in and I'm suctioning as we're doing that. And we see a stomach that's full of liquid. So, so we're quickly going to raise his head up and that allows for pooling of secretions uh, into the fundus area and allows us to safely uh, sort of suction all the fluid in the area. Now, it's usually a very good habit to first look at the fundus during uh, your endoscopies and EUS in patients that are on uh, with MAC that you are not intubating, evacuated of all the secretions, so you don't have to uh, then toil with, uh, with the risk of aspiration. So, we're here around the EG junction and our goal is to evaluate a lesion that they found on endoscopy 
along the lesser curvature. So I'm going to look up slightly and I can already see uh, something deforming the lumen of the GI tract along the lesser curvature here. And to get a sense of how far down this is, I'm going to pull back slightly and try and identify the OG junction. And this is where it is. So moving my scope a little further down, I realize that this is not very far from the OG junction. Now, uh, with the scope in an entirely neutral position with the dials facing up, uh, what we are going to do is slowly introduce it in to where I feel like it might be at the epicenter of the lesion. I simply turn towards it uh, like Dr. Hassan was explaining. Uh, any torquing and turning is usually a function of the left hand, uh, not the right. You want to torque with your left hand or turn your scope with your left hand. So I'm going to turn up onto this lesion and now my focus shifts uh, solely to the EUS image. So here we are, we're looking at the, uh, the EUS image here on uh, Tika. Okay, so I'm being told that the patient desaturated, so I'm going to come out a little bit and we may have to... Achha. So I'm pulling my scope out and we'll just wait for... Uh, any questions? In the If you have to intubate, that's okay too. If you have to intubate, that's okay too. Them go GA, it's probably safer to go GA. We can do another circulation. Okay. 
mouth is not aspirated. No? Are we good to go? Here is Kasar Utado Toda. You must always. Uh, we're back in action. Good. Yeah, we're okay. we're fine. He um, he had a bit of a transient desaturation episode, uh, so we're taking a quick look at the. Uh, you wanna just uh, take a look at the mass and then we're thinking, yeah, yeah. If patient is stable, we can do the rest of it. Nanji, just trying to suction and the stomach yeah. out. Okay. What's that? Convert, yes. Matla? No, no, not to worry, And FNB, the same price? Microtech is cheaper. What do you say? The needle is pretty good. Guys, the CT scan is also. Where is the resident? Nori, can I? So I'm just taking a look to see Kahampe has the lesion. Uh, <coughs> no, just tell me where that uh, lesion was at the CT store. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's a spyglass uh, working channel is 1.2 millimeter. That working channel is 2 millimeter and you can even put a pediatric biopsy. That's interesting. So, uh -huh. so it's interesting, uh, we're looking at this area that appears somewhat uh, indurated and uh, this is just below the EG junction and it doesn't appear to be corresponding to a mass like lesion on the other side. Here we are looking at the, the liver, I'm moving all the way to the aorta here. And we're going to take a 360 degree turn just to make sure that we're not. That's the heart. We're going to go down slightly. Was it close to the this is a pancreas. No, yeah, if I, based on the CT, uh, Dr. Hassan, I think it is along the lesser curvature. So. We're just taking a look here to make sure that we're not incrementally missing anything. And here we see the pancreas. Guys, can we... Ah, there it is. There's something. So I'm going to slowly advance my scope down. And, okay, so there it is. Yeah, it's was uh, yeah, Antral area. Okay. So what we see on endoscopy here is a bulge. You know, fairly in this case, uh, easy to spot. Um, and as you put the transducer up towards it and suction down a little bit, we're seeing uh, quite a large lesion that if I were to describe this, I would call it heterogeneous, meaning that there are dark and light areas. I would call it solid cystic, meaning that, uh, you have a pointer, Okay. 
meaning that uh, there are uh, there are these black areas within it that are cystic um, and one more important thing to evaluate with any uh, type of a subepithelial lesion is what the outer borders look like so when you have a lesion that has a rough outer border that is a sonographic sign of there being a problematic Uh, we lost you. Uh, we lost your mic. Sir, I check early. Under se, unko call karo. Kambis, we can't hear you. Dr. Hassan, you can hear us? Now we can hear you. Okay, sorry, we had some, uh, some battery problems. So, uh, this is the lesion here. And, uh, you know, when you're evaluating uh, something that could potentially be a gist, uh, there are a few features that you sort of uh, uh, want to focus on. One is the size of the lesion. And uh, what you do is you uh, find the two largest dimensions and measure those so we have about 62 by 52 millimeters bear in mind this is a 2d image and uh, doesn't represent the true longitudinal size of it but it is reproducible on endoscopy the other thing that i'll draw focus to here is right where the x is if you notice we have the muscularis propria layer and if i were to guess one layer that this lesion seems to be arising from I would call it the MP layer. Do you agree with that, Dr. Hassan? Yeah, that's what it looks like. Yep. Now, the other part of this that you want to see is if it is uh, exophytic or not. And in this case, most of the lesion is located outside the lumen of the stomach. So I think it is exophytic. Uh, the other part of the description is what uh, the lesion looks like on US. So like we mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if you all uh, heard that, but this is it looks heterogeneous, meaning there are different shades of black to this. There's white areas, there are uh, these very dark, let me see if I can get, there are these very dark areas that are likely cystic uh, sort of areas representing necrotic uh, liquid conversion inside the, uh, the tumor. That usually is a bad prognostic indicator. And you want to look at the exterior border to see if it is smooth and round, and in this case it's not. Uh, we notice a rough border with areas that are quite fuzzy and might uh, represent uh, sort of exophytic and more malignant disease. So I think, you know, in deciding, in deciding, um, so Dr. Shanil here is pointing out that uh, at the very top, yes, we can see two layers. This one here is the MP. If I were to zoom in, um, right here is the MM and this is the MP and again this is contiguous and it appears as though the mass is arising from there. So we're going to now zoom out and the question that we need to answer is uh, should we be sampling this lesion or not? And the general rule of thumb is that if there is any question to the diagnosis is when you want to sample it to further delineate what it's made of. Um, or uh, in, a, in a situation like this, if the lesion is over three centimeters and you're going to subject the patient to surgery uh, and there is a higher risk of metastatic disease, that is when you want to biopsy it and look for things like mitotic rates that would determine your optimal treatment strategy. So I think this is a lesion that we would likely want to sample. Dr. Hassan, any thoughts on that? So uh, I agree with everything you said. There are uh, like whenever you see a sum because of mass, yeah, one thing okay. is you look at the size. Okay, big, more than two centimeter or more than three centimeter. Then you look at the US uh, epigenesis, which is 
had all been any one part of that in the cystic components. Okay, if there are cystic components, heterogeneous, more than three centimeters, and outer surface irregular, all these are features of uh, advanced creation. So, so it's advanced, it uh, could be a, a problematic kind of risk, mm -hmm. which needs to be surgical versus medical. So, in this case, uh, that no bad static lesions that could probably be All right. Dr. Hassan, do you have a particular choice of a needle? And um, uh, can you tell us briefly what the difference is between an FNA and an FNB lesion? And what would determine your choice uh, of the type of needle for a lesion like this? Well, I'll come to uh, that in just a second. To your question, uh, the question was like, can you say these are assisted patients? Yeah, I think the way they are, so dispersed, okay, just, uh, yeah, this is also very uh, vascular in shape too. So could there be a vessel in there? Yes. But there are so many medical of those, so that really indicates it's like that specific kind of vessel, but could one of them be vessel? Yes. It could be. And they are the ones which are like, yeah, operating and they are. Uh, an endo image so coming back. Okay, thank you. So, what uh, question was so FNA versus FNB? FNA versus FNB. Which, what is the choice of needle that you would choose? And uh, uh, what is the most appropriate choice for this type of a lesion? I see you have FNB there, right? <laughs> so we do, we have an FNB. Uh, and, uh, why you sure. That or, uh, Hanji, uh, sure. Okay. So, uh, in general, an FNA needle is not very different from uh, a standard needle that you would use in a catheter. You know, it does a good job at aspirating, a good job at accessing, uh, and it's fairly good um, uh, for um, uh, for things like therapeutics. But when it comes to tissue acquisition, uh, you want to have a needle that is able to cut through the tissue in a way that shears the tissue and harvests what's called a core. Now, in this type of a setting, in theory, if you did not have an FNB needle available in your unit and you had to choose between FNA or nothing, the choice is FNA because what you are not looking for uh, is in any way to characterize the histological tissue architecture. If the question is characterizing the architecture of the tissue, this is in things like lymph node biopsies, in liver biopsies where you need to look at that architecture, in that case you want to always choose an FNB needle, uh, which is a biopsy needle that is going to give you a preserved core of tissue that you can then evaluate. So in this case we chose an FNB needle and the one we chose is uh, the Boston needle that happens to be uh, what we call a Francine tip needle. So the tip of it looks like uh, the cap, the Francine uh, sort of a crown, uh, um, a princess crown. And that uh, tends to give you a circumferential core of tissue. So we are going to uh, now do an FNB. In between, I ran into some trouble with introducing my needle all the way down into the scope. And sometimes what happens when you're in a long position like we are today, uh, the tip of the needle needs to make a bend to go all the way out. And so what I had to do in this case is simply withdraw my scope, straighten the tip of the scope, and that allowed us to then comfortably pass out the, uh, the needle. So here we are. Uh, so we have the needle uh, sort of snug uh, and fixed over here on our channel. There are two sort of uh, rotatory mechanisms to play with. One is the lower mechanism, and if I push this forward, it pushes out a sheath. And if you look on EUS, there's a little white structure that's coming up on the right side. Uh, Dr. Shanil will point out to that just now. So right there, that is the sheath of the needle. So the more I push this out, the more the sheath comes out, and you don't want to push it too much because then it will push the tissue away from you and it will impede your echo coupling so you won't be able to see what you're doing. So you want to put that sheath out just enough to exit your channel 
uh, but not enough to push your tissue away. So I'm now comfortable with the position of the sheath and I'm going to lock it in place, okay, by just screwing down that knob. What I then do is the trocar, if this is inserted all the way in and you'll be handed your FNB needle like that, if you try to puncture tissue with that, what will happen is it will prevent, it's a blunt end of a trocar, it will prevent that needle from going through. So what you want to do is open it and pull it slightly out so that exposes the sharp end of your needle. Now I sort of gently push my scope in to form uh, a slight tent in the tissue. If you notice, uh, my transducer is pressing down on the walls of the stomach and bending it a little bit. So that tells me that there is enough pressure there to allow for unrestricted passage of my needle into the target tissue. Now, when you're starting to biopsy, what some folks would recommend is somehow limiting the depth of insertion of your needle, okay? So if I simply opened this up, uh, excuse me, if I simply dropped uh, uh, this locking mechanism down, held uh, the plunger like this and moved it down quickly, there is nothing that prevents the needle from going into deeper structures. And so there are two ways to do that really. One is we sort of freeze our image and I guess uh, based on a measurement, so that is my sheath. I click here and I say, you know, to enter the lesion, I need about, I can't really see here, but I'm guessing it's about a centimeter, there, 9.4 millimeters. And if I were to get down into the middle of this somewhere, I would need at least four or five. So one way of sort of playing it safe is to move to about four centimeters and lock your needle. Like Dr. Hassan will point out, uh, you know, that is not a foolproof mechanism and it doesn't always translate to linear length. The other way to sort of do that is to use your ring finger and place your ring finger roughly on the distance of the plunger that you think is a safe distance. So that way when I grab the plunger with three of my fingers, I know that when I push this down that it will stop at my ring finger that is sort of holding and fixing the maximal depth that I want to enter. So we're going to sort of push our scope in again. I'm going to throw on a quick Doppler and you always want to make sure that there are no large vessels that uh, intervene. Uh, one second, so where is our... There are large vessels, that's what we were uh, uh, talking earlier. Hanji. So I think, uh, one second, where is the acoustic input? Huh. There. So uh, that's right. So to Dr. Hassan's point, uh, it's, it's very true. There's a lot of vessels here and that's what makes these lesions very likely to bleed in the lumen of the GI tract. The vessels that are inside the tumor, we're generally not that worried about. Those vessels are going to bleed, but they'll be tamponaded by a sort of mechanical tamponade by the tissue. The ones we are truly worried about are the vessels that are going to be in a more free space uh, that I fracture and then are going to bleed into the peritoneum. So those are the problematic vessels. Now, I, you know, we are putting on our Doppler and we, are tr we probably have to go down on the gain a little bit. Uh, yeah. uh, go down. Yeah. I there think it we go. looks okay and not too, well, too bad. It's a more gain up there. L more gain, you think, Dr. and I agree. So, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to just take off that Doppler. I know I'm in a safe position. And we're going to slowly put out our needle. There you can see that the needle is sort of exiting the sheath. I push down on it a little bit to tent the mucosa. And once I think we're in a comfortable position, uh, we then sort of make a quick plunge into the tissue and at this point I know my needle has entered uh, the lesion. So right there we have the needle, you can see the echogenic tip, it's entered into the tissue and now we have somebody slowly pull back on the, yeah, go ahead. slowly pull back on that trocar as I enter in and come out. So I'm entering in and coming out, this is a more rapid insertion, a slightly slower withdrawal and as we are doing that 
uh, we are playing with our larger knobs to move the lesion respective to the needle and sample a different area. So I'm moving down, then I move the lesion a little to the right, I sample that area, then I sort of can torque my scope a little bit if needed and sample this area here. Okay, so we are sort of fanning in an anterior posterior direction by moving our uh, wheels, our larger wheels, and at no point am I exiting this tissue. And with about four or five strokes, typically you're able to uh, harvest a fairly good uh, core. Now, as I'm doing that, we've been slowly pulling back on the plunger, and that creates for us a capillary effect that helps with tissue withdrawal. So, let's uh, pull it. So as we're pulling, we're going to take a little more tissue and I'm going to then, now that we are happy, just simply withdraw the needle, pull my locking mechanism up, lock the, uh, uh, the needle and then simply untwine and hand out the, the needle to our assistant. Come. So now, uh, camera on the jasakin, jasakin. Okay, so we're going to slowly go down to the uh, to the tissue processing uh, area. Um, hmm? If you don't mind, I just go quickly and so as endosonographers, tissue processing is uh, is really key, and knowing how to sort of evaluate tissue macroscopically. Uh, is going to help you with uh, being able to assess uh, the adequacy of your biopsy. So what we're doing here is we've exposed the uh, we've exposed the needle. Yahan pe camera nahi aa sakte na locally. Okay, sirf needle tip ko dikha de yahan pe. So what we're doing here, Vaseem has the tip of the needle exposed on a glass slide. I'm not sure how well this is projecting. And we can see. You can can you make those uh, okay. hands bigger? Guys? Hands bigger? Like the ca that camera bigger. Make okay. the whole screen. Up zoom. The way it was earlier. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that's Vaseem uh, with the tip of the needle exposed. You want to try not to touch that to any structures because it's ultimately going to go back uh, into your yes. patient. Just and go to the image. And as we are inserting the stylet and we get closer to the end, we're going to start seeing some tissue expressed from the tip of the needle. So I'm not sure how well this is projecting. Uh, but it's we have projecting very well. We can see the tissue. So those are cores of tissue. Was in a minute. Uh, huh. Or dusra slide the cover. So those are cores that we are expressing down. Okay, touch So these are do we have four sets? So Vasim here has done a, a great job of sort of exposing the cores. Uh, here we have some more uh, that's present. I'm just going to take a set of forceps and uh, uh, pull the tissue out ideally without touching the uh, the needle. Once we're happy with that, we cap the needle. So needle piche lalija. So we cap the needle and we prepare it for another FNB. Now, what we see here are sort of thick cores of tissue. And the key sort of instruction point here is not to take another slide and put it on top of that and smudge it. If you do that, you're going to destroy that core and no one will be able to sort of assess in a block its architecture. Instead of that, what we do is we take our tweezers and I simply gently hold that core and rub it along that slide so that uh, the cells on top of it sort of rub off onto the glass tissue and once we're done with that we then formalin conference we then put our cores into formalin okay. now what we've created is uh, a slide that has what we call touch imprint um, 
our unit published uh, sort of a, a paper on the um, on the importance of touch imprint cytology that uh, Dr. Hassan headed that uh, project uh, to see whether or not uh, sort of it determines the type of resection that you're going to do. Um, in this case, it is helpful because you're saving the core of your tissue and at the same time you have enough cells there to get an adequate histological evaluation. So we're now going to do a quick diff that uh, Vasim will do. And the bigger question that you want to answer here as an endosonographer in your unit is whether or not you need to send this for flow cytometry. That usually is the big question because if our question is lymphoma or no lymphoma, then simply getting uh, a, um, a sort of a, a smear or cores is not going to be enough. You need to send that out uh, in flow cytometry. And so if you have the ability to have a pathologist or a cytopathologist look at the slide that is helpful but if you don't uh, having an understanding of what the basic interpretation of what we call a spindle cell tumor which this could be or most likely is versus uh, something like a neuroendocrine uh, or a lymphoma is going to be very helpful now I'm not an expert at uh, pathology but uh, Dr. Hassan there is so what I'm going to do is uh, put the slides under the microscope and we're going to sort of evaluate uh, what the cells look like and answer the basic question of adequacy and whether or not we need ancillary staining. Yeah, I think uh, we can put a slide, take that slide off, we just want to put a slide. Uh, Cytolite, and they have their special uh, media. So the lab will usually send you that. Cytolite, yeah. Yeah. This is all formal, and once you put it into formula, I can find out. We use basic cytolite, but I can send you what uh, the lab. No? Yeah. Cytolite is usually good. It sends viable cells. Hmm. Which one do we use? Uh, I can find out. I can find out what we use. But I can also tell you that all our processing is done on site. So yes, we sort of have the the So, uh, Dr. Hassan, we have a question here that I'm fumbling with a little bit. The question is uh, how... You want to take another biopsy? Uh, go ahead. The question is how do we um, uh, transport our medium for flow cytometry? Now, we generally use cytolite. But yeah. uh, do you know of a particular type of cytolite that is being used at our unit? No, there's a flow cytometry, that's a separate uh, the solution. Kit, right? Yeah. That is not a cytolite itself. So, so yeah, if, if you go back, yeah, right here, can you focus there? Mm. Let's go flash, please. So here, uh, uh, just keep focus there. You see these, some of these cells, right? Mm -hmm. They're like a kidney share, right here. So these are not like a spindle cell. They are not like a here, and this is called an epithelial like uh, So like if the cells look like epithelium, but still there's like a spindle cell. And I don't see a lot of spindle cells. I do see this one here, here. Uh, do you have any you know, other it's funny, cells? but it's key to tip there. It becomes actually less and less echogenic, and if I mm -hmm. never figured out why that is, the uh, more you buy we have another slide? Uh, we should have another slide, Hanji. Vaseem, there are second slide. I'm just finishing the biopsies here. Yeah, you uh, do so that, that we... This does not look like a lymphoma at all. So I'm not worried about that. Either. Okay, so what would, you, what would you expect to see in a lymphoma on an FN, uh, on a touch imprint, Dr. Hassan? How so would those cells look different? That's like a, these are, if you look at these cells, a lot of those are like a kidney shape and uh, like more like a, a longitudinal cell. They're not round cells. Mm -hmm. They're not like. So. Uh, when they're around, it's a very so. Let me just see them. Come. Like uh, this is the and the so uh, this is perfect. Be a that okay. is, there is there anything to look, uh, to point out? Um, 
यार कोई पॉइंटर है इज देर एनी पॉइंट नो पॉइंटर दैट आई कैन यूज दैट्स द की सो डॉक्टर हसन what what do you think about this uh, are there any uh, any sort of round cells or uh, on the other hand spindle type cells that might indicate either a leiomyoma or a gist uh, uh, no, leiomyoma or gist you cannot differentiate on just the slide itself but right with this staining they got to do a cd12 117 other staining uh, uh, to differentiate between the uh, leiomyoma and gist but i do see spindle cells on there i do not see any cells which worry me about lymphoma objects now uh, now how how are you telling uh, the spindle cells from a gist apart from the spindle cells that you would normally see uh, in any type of a transgastric uh, transmural biopsy what what on this slide tells those apart uh, so in this particular slide they are like if they are just really from the muscularis propria or muscularis mucosa those spindle cells would be very longitudinal spindle in group cells but here is a like a individual cell you see a lot of those and they are not very spindly this is usually epithelialized gist so this is uh, the way these nuclei look like again oval shaped some of those are longitudinal some of those are the uh, uh uh not Recount very spindly yeah. Mm-hmm. but uh, uh the spindle take out in the yeah. formula oh, medical so they don't need mass so uh does but there is a, some suggestion like uh if you look uh, uh like look at this look at this right so heterogeneity is what you are refer- uh, what you are pointing out dr hasan is that right just yeah, different looking cells not to cells heterogeneous is like a, that could be a, like a, that means like a different uh, like a group of different shapes or uh, different uh, sizes and does the fact that they are not clustering and that they are isolated on that uh, slide make any difference to uh to the interpretation no and it really does not i think it's because it's a uh, touch prep it's not a, a smear mm-hmm. that's why they look more like an individual cells okay dr hasan we're going to just quickly show you what our sample looks like and um, ek minute dikhana just shake let's see shake kar do usko and uh, what would you consider an adequate specimen so how do you determine ek minute dikhana yeah the focus for uh, can i have a white uh, background so dr hasan here we're seeing uh, the the specimen and i notice some cores at the bottom uh, how would you recommend uh, you know we assess for adequacy uh, of the specimen when um, uh, when you're sort of evaluating something like this so i see uh, if just it's not it visible down. keep it down where it is keep it down so just okay. keep it in one place there. and uh, let the camera focus up focus kar dena ek minute uh, do you guys see like there are some drops sitting in here and there is a this is a, a little bit no just uh, just yeah. hang in there don't move too much guys so if you can focus it you can just hold still yeah we let sure. it focus so here you see this is a bright red blood there right and then there is some this bone like white tissue it's not like really so that i have unrestricted access on the right so uh you can just quantify 
Let's see if they have any questions. Do, do, Dr. Hassan, any questions for us before we uh, sort of ungown and head out? Uh, no, we are good. Thank you so much. Excellent Th demonstration. Thank you. So, uh, I can talk a little bit more about that. I mean, I think it's just a little bit more. Exopetic. The way they do the boring, right? If they keep going in one place, they get all the soil out of it in one go. If you keep going in the same place over and over, nothing is going to fall off. So core need is like a bore needle. So once you go into one area, you may be able to get some more tissues if you go in twice in that same area. But the chances are likely you're just going to get blood in the second one. So with the F and D needle, either once go into one area or maximum twice. Then bring it out. What you are asking is when you bring it out, do you get out of the tissue? No. You just come to the edge of it and then change the direction. There are different ways, what we call a fanning technique. You can move the big wheel away from you or towards you. That's what I would do first. If that doesn't work, gently move the scope in or scope out or rotate the scope to the right or the left. So the whole goal is to go into the different area than the previous one. So there are different ways to do that. So if it's a F and B, usually F and A needle we used to teach, like you gotta go four times in one place and then do it quick and then uh, change it to different directions. So four and four, four different A directions, each four times, that would be 16 times. And sometimes we use suction, other times we don't use suction. And uh, so uh, with the FNA needle, that's what you got to do. With the FNB needle, you will feel it when the tissue comes into the needle. You get that tactile sensation many times. And, but you don't need to go more than once or twice in one area. And uh, three to four times, three different areas, that should be good enough uh, with the FNB needle. So crushing artifact mostly happens when you do it on the slide. Like when you're using it like a, a too hard when you're making the smear. Crushing doesn't happen really. If you have too much tissue into the needle, you can think like it may be causing crushing. It usually doesn't because it's a very hollow needle. It will keep pushing the tissue out. So it only happens crushing artifact on the slide. And, uh, but not really, uh, I think, uh, very low risk of that. Our, uh, the only time the crushing defect happens when you have a blob of tissue on the slide and you try to compress it with a, uh, like you have a lot of tissue and you try to compress it with the slide. So that's going to cause a crushing effect. In that case, get a tweezer and just move the tissue around on the slide instead of using a second slide to smear it. Any other question? <coughs> About the uh, uh, EUS itself, procedure itself? <coughs> 